In our first e-lecture about vowels, we discussed the general principles involved in the articulation of vowels and the main phonetic parameters of their description. We defined vowels as speech sounds that involve pulmonic air and a free air passage through the vocal tract. Furthermore, we showed how the cardinal vowel chart can be constructed as a reference system for the articulatory description of vowels and we looked at the main parameters used for the classification of vowels. They are tongue position. Now depending on the position of the tongue or more precisely on the location of the narrowing in the vocal tract, vowels can be defined as front vowels, as central vowels or as back vowels. The second parameter is referred to as tongue height. With the parameter tongue height we can classify high vowels, mid-high vowels, mid-low vowels and low vowels. And finally we have lip rounding. All vowels can be produced with rounded lips or with unrounded or spread lips. Here we have indicated this by means of different colors. The vowels that have to be produced with unrounded lips are represented in red and the blue ones have to be produced with a rounded lip position. The central ones are represented in black because they involve some sort of neutral lip position. Let us look at some examples. E is an unrounded mid-high front vowel. O is a rounded mid-high back vowel. U is an unrounded high back vowel. And R is a low central vowel. With these three parameters, we have defined a reference system that can be used to describe the vowels that are used in the languages of the world. And here we can identify several different types of vowels and then we can relate them to the system of the cardinal vowels. Let us start with monothongs. Monothongs or simple vowels consist of one simple articulatory posture. All languages have monothongs. And these monothongs can now be positioned on the vowel chart in relationship to the cardinal vowels. Remember, the cardinal vowels are reference vowels. That is, they involve extreme articulatory possibilities, but they are not necessarily realizations of the vowels of any particular language. Let us illustrate this with the vowel E in three different languages. Now, the E in French is known to be an E that is extremely close to cardinal one. It is clearly an unrounded high front vowel. Words such as C or linguistique illustrate the high tongue position and the front tongue position of this type of E. The E in German is still very high and very much fronted. However, it is slightly lower than the French one. A key word would be feel, which means much in English. And as you can hear, it is a bit more away from cardinal one than the French one. Well, and the E in C, for example, in RP is slightly centralized and it is halfway between cardinal 1 and 2. An example, I've already pronounced it, would be C. To make such judgments requires intensive phonetic training. And even then phoneticians often have different opinions about the exact placement of a vowel on the vowel chart. Since a precise placement in terms of a tiny dot is impossible anyway, we suggest to use relatively large squares for the representation of vowels that are produced with unrounded lips and relatively large circles for the representation of vowels that are produced with rounded lips. 
Let us now look at the second type of vowels, the diphthongs. A diphthong is a vowel which undergoes considerable change of quality during pronunciation. Therefore, it appears to have two parts, an onset, the first vowel, and an offset, the second vowel. And between them, there is a transition from the first to the second, the so-called glide. On the basis of this glide, they can be defined as upgliding diphthongs. Some people call them closing diphthong because they end in a high or close position, but more popular is the term upgliding. In upgliding diphthongs, the onset, which is somewhere here, is always lower than the offset, which is somewhere here. The second possibility is this one, the downgliding possibility. Now here the onset is in each case higher than the offset. Here are the offsets. So we have downgliding and some people call them opening diphthongs. And finally, the third possibility are the so-called centering diphthongs, where in each case the offset is somewhere in the center and the onsets are somewhere near the edges of the vowel chart. An alternative term would be centering diphthong. A less common classification defines diphthongs according to the prominence of one of their parts. If the second part of the offset is prominent, you have a rising diphthong. If the first part or the onset is prominent, you have a falling diphthong. Cross-linguistically, the onsets, that is, the first part of a diphthong, as well as the direction or transition or glide, and the distance of tongue movement vary considerably. Again, we can show that on the vowel chart. Here are three examples of the diphthong OI from the Virtual Linguistics Campus. Now, the OI in Spanish has the highest onset. DOI Again? Doi. It is somewhere between a mid and a mid-high vowel and it is certainly front up gliding ending in an unrounded front vowel. The onset of the diphthong oi in German Hoi is lower and the front up glide ends in a high front vowel which involves some degree of lip rounding as indicated by the symbol used for the offset. Somewhere in between we have the British English RP version. Boy. Again. Boy. Now this diphthong involves an almost mid onset and the shortest transition, the shortest glide. It is still front up gliding, but the front up glide ends in an unrounded mid-high centralized vowel. Judgments like these require intensive phonetic training. This cannot be emphasized often enough. And even then phoneticians keep arguing about the exact placement of the vowels and their parts on the cardinal vowel chart. Let's now look at the next possibility of classifying vowels. One possibility is to look at nasalization. Now normally in all vowels the velum is closed and we have some sort of velic closure. So this is referred to as velic closure. And the air does not flow out 
through the nose. Now, if the velum is lowered, like here, we have a velic opening. And now, part of the airstream can fill the nasal cavity. It never escapes through the nasal cavity. It fills the nasal cavity and uses the nasal cavity as a second resonance chamber. This effect is referred to as nasalization. Nasalized vowels are represented by their standard symbol, but then they receive an additional symbol, the symbol a diacritic, which looks like this, to indicate that they are nasalized. Here are two examples from French and Polish, two languages that have nasalized vowels. Now let's listen. Polish Herbatę. Książka and French Son. Son. Okay. Another possibility of classifying vowels is in terms of voicing. Normally vowels are voiced, that is the vocal folds vibrate. However, there are languages where we can find voiceless or whispered vowels. In Japanese, the vowels E and U are often devoiced or voiceless, especially when they occur in a syllable final position or after voiceless fricatives. The diacritic that is used to indicate devoicing is a circle underneath the vowel as a subscript. Well, let's listen to these examples from Japanese where you can clearly hear the contrast between voiceless and voiced vowels. Now here we have a speaker from the main island of Japan from Ako and here you find the contrast. Now first of all a voiced vowel iru. and now a voiceless variant Sta. Sta. and you can hear that the e after h is voiceless. The same over here Unagi. Unagi. and the, a voiceless vowel Sukiyaki. Sukiyaki. Okay. Now finally we have vowels that are called semivowels. All semivowels or approximants are problematic for phonetic analysis. Here are two semivowels. Semivowels are similar to vowels since they allow an almost free air passage. However, the degree of narrowing is higher than that of the corresponding vowel. The palatal approximant y is similar to cardinal 1e and the labiovelar approximant w is similar to cardinal number 8. Again, let's listen to some cross-linguistic examples from the Virtual Linguistics Campus Language Index that illustrate the phenomenon of semivowels, which are in the consonantal classification classified as approximant. So here we have some semivowels. For example, yes, in English, yak, in Bulgarian the palatal approximant, or here the uh, labiovelar approximant in English, wet, or the same in Arabic, wasl. And you hear the quality is almost like that of a vowel. So this is a very difficult issue, the treatment of semivowels as vowels or consonants. Let us summarize. As a result of this e-lecture, you should have understood 
how the various types of vowels can be classified using the central parameters tongue position, tongue height, lip rounding and additional features such as nasalization or devoicing. With this knowledge and a sufficient amount of phonetic training you should now be able to identify the vowels of different languages and different speakers in order to relate them to the cardinal vowels. But you have to practice this essential phonetic ability. For this purpose I recommend that you use the interactive tutor on the Virtual Linguistics Campus with its ear training options or simply join our phonetics and phonology classes where you are supplied with a wealth of exercise material.